Thank you, Mace. Yeah, and really just huge appreciation to the board, as always, who are really making this space happen and the volunteers. It's, as many of you see, it's transforming before your eyes into this just beautiful place of practice. Look at this amazing piece of furniture. I think that just arrived. Wow. Sorry, folks on the screen. You're, you're not missing anything. Um, or you'll see it when you come in. It's really lovely. And um, Mace has said this a couple times, but it just feels like such a refuge that we get to be here together. We get to practice together. And um, so many of us have had that opportunity to practice in this flow and in this weave in the last years. And I really um, can't think of anything so valuable. And yet it's such a, you know, it's such a specific choice that we make each day, right? To participate and be together. There's no contract. No one's gonna, you know, ask where you were if you don't show up. And yet each of us being here matters so much. So I just really appreciate, really appreciate all of you coming. And wanna, you know, emphasize that the San Francisco Dharma Collective is truly a radical space. Right. And in, in its aspiration to transform the way we practice together and also this opportunity to have a space that really embraces the community effort. Right. That as I always say, it's Chogyam Trumpa and I was wrong. So I'm going to have to update that it's Thich Nhat Han who said that the Buddha of the future is the Sangha, meaning that our our awake nature is not a person and not a guru, but it's all of us together. And I really feel that here. And one of our priorities at the San Francisco Dharma Collective is to create a space that feels welcoming, that feels as though folks can really get what they need in the teachings and do so without worry that they're going to be um, subject to harm or discomfort or difficulty. And so in our desire to create a space that um, can hold a variety of life experiences, we are always open and eager for your feedback on how to support that. And one thing I'll ask all of you is when we do engage in discussion and meaningful speech, as we will hear, that we do so from a place of this is also practice. So it's not, oh yeah, we meditated, now I raise my hand, I'm just gonna say whatever, <laughs> right? Uh, we are also engaging <clears throat> in a mindful speech. We're talking and speaking our words imbued with compassion. Importantly, we are listening with compassion to what others are saying, recognizing how little we might know of the complexity that they're living. So that's my, my aspiration for us here tonight. We are going to be touching gently the subjects of sadness and equanimity. So last week we did fear and empathetic joy. So sorry if y'all came back for the joy talk again. It's on YouTube, it was a hit. I, I will say, um, just as a, a kind of lead in, I really find sadness to be just such an incredibly rich emotion and such an incredibly rich emotion for the Dharma, um, for our practice. There is such a nowness in loss. And since what triggers sadness is loss, it could be something just a disappointment. Oh, they closed my favorite ice cream shop. Let's hope not. And that would be a moment, right? Or to the greater losses of so many other things in our lives and so many things we're witnessing in the lives of those around the world. And that sadness, it just, it forces this present moment feeling that's gone. There's no, what will happen then? Like it's, it's gone. And there's something about that feeling that just, at least in my experience and my practice, so deeply grounding and so beautiful. Um, really hard, really painful, but I think if we can invite ourselves to move towards this emotion and understand it and maybe dance with it, that we will find some of its richness and be able to honor it. It pairs well beautifully with equanimity. You know, equanimity in some ways also is a really present experience in which we're recognizing just that everything is always changing. I have been 
meeting both Adrian Marie Brown and Octavia Butler at the same time, and they are happily, you know, overlapping. Yes, I see some hand clapping, <clears throat> you know, and the famous line of Octavia Butler that um, Adrian Marie Brown quotes a lot is changes God. And everything that changes us, everything changes us. We are changing everything and changed by it. And so that feels like a really um, important way for us to understand this experience of equanimity and impermanence as powerful, not just, okay, I'm resigned to that. Oh yeah, equanimity, I guess that's when I check out and I don't care anymore. Okay, I can do that. This is a powerful calling in. A powerful calling in. So the first practice we'll do together tonight, one of my favorite practices, period, but I think an interesting practice for equanimity. And it's one of, it's the classic teachings of Bahia, who's an ancient um, teacher and loves this simplicity. And the way that he speaks is inviting us to, in what we see, let it simply be seen. In what is heard, let it simply be heard. In what is felt or sensed, let it simply be felt and sensed. It's this invitation to be with the rawness of our experience outside of our projections, outside of our preference. Like, oh, I like that or don't like that or when's this going to end or why is it like that? So this kind of simple meeting of our direct experience as an equanimity practice. So we will start with that, talk a little bit more and engage in discussion about sadness and equanimity. And my aspiration <clears throat> is for us to also do a nice handshake practice or a compassion practice with, with sadness. So without further ado, after that great preamble, let's find a comfortable position. And for many of us, this has been a full day with a lot of different iterations. So giving yourself this luxury of really transitioning into practice by attending closely to your posture. As we invite our upright spine, feel as though it was the first time we ever made that adjustment. And as we soften and relax through the muscles in the face and the chest and the belly, feel it as though a waterfall of release. I'm checking in on the shoulders, seeing where the hands are placed and whether the hands can be placed in a way that the shoulders feel at ease and not strained. Find the gentleness of the breath. And feel the whole body breathing.
noticing the mind, of course, and it's busy work. And giving yourself this incredible generosity of just letting it all go. Even if just for one breath, you can sustain the attention fully through the inhale and the exhale. Give a refreshment to your whole mind, body, and heart. And for a couple moments, imagine that each breath were truly a gift that was just being offered up as a way to sample and experience the preciousness of life. So receiving this gift, maybe stirring the heart of gratitude, and then extending the exhale as though it were a gift in return, a reciprocity. Let's take a moment here and connect with the motivation that brought us here together tonight. You could be anywhere doing anything and you're here in community with these teachings. Maybe just a felt sense of connection arises. Maybe a word or phrase. But consider with clarity the intention for being here how your presence here connects to the work and care and love we bring to the world. Allow this intention to recede into the background. And let's di direct the light of our awareness and attention to the feelings of sensations in the body. As it is classically said, in whatever is felt, let it be felt. Instead of thinking this hurts or that's pleasant or why is that aching? Just rawly meet the experience, just as it is, of sensations through the body.
Let the attention be clear and directed only to sensations in the body. As though your attention and awareness were a searchlight, only able to see what was in focus one at a time, sensation to sensation, noticing how they shift and change and reemerge. Feeling the sensations of the body from within the body itself. If possible, without even labeling as warm or tingling. Just meeting is experiencing, noticing, observing. Attending closely. Gently shifting the spotlight of our attention now to the sense portals of taste and smell. This might be quite subtle, maybe a lingering taste from food or tea, maybe the smell of your own shampoo or the room around you. Without judgment, as much as possible without preference, Simply noticing what can be noticed through smell and taste. It's okay if you get distracted and caught up in fantasy or planning. Simply relax and release whatever has captured your attention for just a couple more moments here, allowing whatever is smelled or tasted to simply be smelled or tasted without any extra.
Let's shift the searchlight of our attention now to sound. Letting what is heard simply be heard. Receiving whatever sounds arise as much, much as possible without preference or judgment. Letting our attention and awareness be saturated by the tapestry of sounds just as they arise. Some sounds are steady in the background, others are rising and then falling away. Could we hear sound just as tone or frequency instead of hearing it as car door opening, feet moving, just receiving sound as sound?
then very gently we'll shift our attention and awareness to the sense portal of sight. To do so, we'll bring our chin down towards our chest so that our gaze is into our own lap. And before we blink our eyes open, just imagining opening our eyes for the very first time without a sense of what we'd be seeing, just shapes and colors, light movement. Very gently opening the eyes and just receiving what is seen. Letting all your attention and awareness be saturated by seeing colors and shapes and shadows. And gently blinking the eyes closed, and returning the head to rest evenly on top of the neck. We shift our attention and awareness now to the sense portal of perception, in the mind. Just as we noticed other phenomena arise and fall. We notice as thoughts, memories and images arise, but we remain uninvolved no judgment, no preference. And what is perceived, let it simply be perceived. In between these thought formations is the spaciousness of mind. Maybe we lean back into this spaciousness of mind, observing gently whatever arises. And observing gently as it passes away. may be hard to notice at first as the thought arrives, takes us away. Like keep relaxing and expanding the horizon so you can notice as these thoughts arise. But we remain uninvolved, letting them just keep going, dissipating back from where they came like the sound that arrives 
and passes away into the distance. Maybe you even notice that some thoughts seem to come on quickly and others are slow. Some feel especially sticky and exciting. Others may be heavy or dragging. As much as possible, not involving ourselves in the energy of the thoughts, leaning back into that more spacious awareness. Now inviting in this observation to include all the sense portals, sensations in the body, sounds, smell and taste, maybe even the shadows and light from behind closed eyes, and of course thoughts. Observe with gentle curiosity whatever is arising. And whatever arises, let it simply be.
Thank you for your practice. So any questions or reflections on the practice in which in some ways we are literally trying to embody our equanimity, right? Not being moved, not exercising a preference or judgment for one thing or the other, being with what's there. If folks online have a question, feel free to raise your hand. Diane, are you our host tonight? Gnome's our host, so you can let Gnome know. <laughs> Thank you. Any thoughts, questions, reflections on your practice? Yes, Mace. Yeah, I'll repeat, I'll repeat what Mace says. Yeah. Mm. Yes. So Mace expresses that she finds sound the easiest to do that practice with because there's this natural kind of emergence and falling away often. So there is a subtle hum in the back of this room and in most rooms, but that the hardest is sight. And I do think it's hard in, in the context of this practice, but it's something that all of us experience now and then when you're sitting somewhere and you kind of are no longer like looking at things as things or objects. It's a lot easier in nature you know when we're not kind of in our social comparison mind game uh who's better than me who's worse than me where do i sit um, but if we're just kind of relaxing and receiving it's really the energy of receiving and not being um again like not getting over involved because we could absolutely sit in a forest and be like hmm wonder how long this forest is going to survive is that pine beetle is that oak, is that an oak death like we could make it a source of it's but it is that like that receiving and with the sounds i find myself i was like really we're doing sound meditation and now there's no sound on 24th street <laughs> i was like are you kidding me um but and like i can feel myself leaning out to sound right and what we want to do is is again we're practicing this um ability to be undisturbed which also means un all uninvolved and not grasping towards it Right, so there's an interesting way. I think sound, I mean, sound meditation is just so awesome. You know, it's such an interesting way to train the mind. But I think that energy of really kind of being with it as it is, those instructions, is that receiving energy. And with, with sight, yeah, also like looking at your own hands and like it's pretty dull. Um, I, I do find, you know, I have a, a place in my house where I can look out and there's enough of a horizon and a lot of different houses and it's like varied, but I'll just focus in on one window. And I'm like, no, no, that's not the process, right? Like there's this, it's really keeping that softness um, possible. So thanks for the comment. Anyone else? Questions or thoughts on that practice, which is, I, sorry, I didn't mention it. it's called mindfulness of phenomena. Is there something in the chat there? Oh, yeah, I can read it. Yeah. Can you hear me? Um, I can. Hi, no, nice to see you. We miss Hi. you. Lovely to see you. Lovely to see you, Stace and everyone. Um, it says, thank you, Eve. What felt like sticky Velcro in my mind, I built from a difficult situation just prior to entering our gathering. Hmm. Unhooked and fell away. And just before we came back and my mind felt like a hummingbird cleaning herself soft and vibrant. Wow. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? That's awesome. Hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I do think this practice is such a cool one to move towards the settling of the mind in its natural state. We do that practice so often here together, we did during the Lojong, and it's such a, you know, that observing of the mind, that soft observing, it's cool to let your body and your senses instruct you of, of how to do that. So I think it's a, it's a nice way. I find it a really um, helpful way in to that practice. Yeah. Other thoughts or questions, comments, protests? Uh, I'll make a quick comment. Um, Please. Yeah, just that those that the going from sense to sense, I love that. I love that so mm. much. And to what May said, for me also, sound is the easiest. And it, uh, I, I find myself being able to really, or sometimes being able to notice, am I really just hearing that sound as sound versus am I, you know, picturing a bird or a bus right. or, you know, so it's really cool for kind of differentiating the senses out. That's what I really love about it. Mm. Yeah. And it's, it's tricky you. because we just label stuff right away. We're like, bird. I know. And then, yeah. and then you miss the sound. Yes. <laughs> you call it a bird, you miss the sound. Yes. That's, <laughs> thank you for highlighting that, Noam. I think that's the, that's the piece we're trying to slow down, unpack, almost kind of like unpeel in a way. I was thinking I had um, some sensation in my, in my left glute, and I've had you know, back injury and issues there. And I was like, can I feel that sensation as sensation? and not like, oh, that's that thing I don't like feeling. Oh, what's wrong? Oh, it hurts. And just being like dull, heavy, you know, like all the different ways that we can actually phenomenologically, such a fancy word, uh, <laughs> experience what's happening. And similarly with the sound, I mean, we can see how much perception influences our life when we try to not hear a car door open, when we hear that like boop, boop, like, come on, we, <laughs> we know what that is. And so, you know, part of the teaching of why this shows us equanimity is that it shows us how hard it is to be with reality as it is. Whether that reality is coming through the sense portal of sound or touch or smell or, you know, we, we are meeting it immediately with our perception and which often is a projection. So who cares that I know it's a car door opening? But then when I hear criticism in the way, you know, someone's talking to me, immediately as the words come out, I realize I'm projecting, right? Like that appraisal or that perception or projection, or we hear a certain sound and it's threatening or upsetting and just really interesting. Some of these things ensure our survival, that immediate meeting with our perception, and a lot of them shortcut and make it actually really hard for us to see reality as it is, things changing. Yeah. Great questions and observations. Anyone else? I see Ben thinking, but I'm not sure if he's quite ready. My mic doesn't even work. Oh, maybe it does work. Okay, okay uh, we can hear you. Oh, um, I wasn't going to speak. Here are two things off the dome. First thing, <laughs> this is a very, this is a very um, shinzen -y practice. And Shinzen Young mm -hmm. has, has a cool sort of, you know, three by two grid of ways to categorize uh, sort of sense phenomena that includes both internal seeing and, and external seeing. So images we see in our mind, something like this. Similarly, um, hearing external sounds, hearing internal talk, and uh, and feel. I guess there's the analogy is feeling external things via, I guess, touch, and feeling internal things via something like emotions. So, I think that's kind of cool. Yeah, and it, you know, and Shinzen makes it very active: seeing, seeing, feeling, feeling. Right? There's a immediacy, and it's true. Our senses are right now. 
So there's another kind of layer or aspect of this practice, which is it's not happening in the future. It's happening right now. Yeah, there's so much there. Um, so I'm going to have us maybe transition now. Took some notes here, my phone. Um, um, to sadness and equanimity. Um, yeah, I really, you know, we could, of course, make an atlas of all the emotions as we did, or an atlas of just a single emotion. And it would just be such a rich one, sadness. I was meditating on um, loss this morning and um, so many different varieties and flavors, so many different ways to feel it. And I am uh, going to take a informal poll if you feel so inclined who is experiencing some form of like loss right now in their life, missing something, fear of missing something, losing something. I see two hands up. I'm going to think Ken there. Yes. Yeah, it's the thing is, it's so prevalent. And anyone who wasn't raising their hands was either shy or not paying attention, right? As we are aging, um, all of us and losing capacities of different kinds, as we face the loss at a global level of so many different things, including psychological safety, um, ecological safety. Um, and yeah, there's just a lot of loss that we can dip into. We spoke about empathic distress about a month back, right after the um, most recent shootings and that sense of getting kind of drenched in despair, you know, and what's interesting about the empathic distress type of sadness feeling is we are taking the sadness of others personally. And there's nothing quite wrong with that except that it actually makes us feel alone. So our empathic distress is a response to the suffering of others is a, what's sometimes just described as self-related concern. So what we're saying essentially in our head is, I can't handle that. I can't handle that suffering. It's very different than having compassion. And I just wanna point that out as a distinction. So we think of compassion as I am moved, I am motivated by being in the face or witnessing the suffering of others. I'm motivated as opposed to I can't handle the suffering of others. And especially the I can't handle, it's an interesting turn of phrase. And I think I am familiar <laughs> with that feeling uh, often. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's interesting to think about the overwhelm, that tipping point to overwhelm. I, I often describe, you know, stress as the over arousal of our emotion. So we can be kind of anxious or we can be kind of frustrated, but when it tips over to being, you know, feeling as though it's um, more than we can handle or more than a certain situation can, can deal with the intensity or the density of it, then it becomes stress. And I was thinking about the stress of, of sadness, you know, the stress of our despair in a way of like, I can't handle this. That empathic distress really feels like stress. And especially looking at um, not only what may be going on in our immediate life, but looking at what's going on at the global level. And it can really feel like, what is the point? Why is there this emotion of sadness? Wouldn't it just be kind of more efficient we didn't have to deal with that one. We could just move forward and get mobilized. Curious, what does anyone think? What's the function of feeling sadness and in response to the world? Mace. Yeah. Yeah, Mace is saying, is it so that we feel connected and can and and not feel alone? Did I see a hand? Is that Gina there? No. Yes. Please. It it shows that we're human. Yeah. That we can feel 
for others and for what's happening in the world. As much as we can feel pain, we can feel also joy. Yeah. In a way, uh, mm. the balance is 360. Mm. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Chrissy. Yes. Yeah. All the grief. All who, yeah. So Chrissy's pointing out that in a recent experience of grief, it connects her to all of the grief, which is very much, um, yeah, what Gina's saying, which is like this, it is our humanity. It shows our humanity. And that there is, you know, it's so interesting, you know, grief is distinct from sadness, because in grief, there's many different emotions. But this idea that our, our grief or our sadness can include or almost be pierced by joy. Because we actually recognize what we've lost. We recognize and feel the value so deeply of what we've lost. So there's just this kind of um, back and forth that do yeah it's some of the actual movement of this world probably right is that feeling of loss and grief and the sweetness of what it is we've lost that's not the only way it goes we can feel loss and be pissed right like no not like this no why did you do that for you know we just can't accept and it's interesting, that's a different kind of sadness. It's, it's anguish. So that's not sorrow, that's a protesting sadness. I don't, I'm not judging it. It has its place, um, but yes. Yeah, anguish is a, is a form of sadness that's called protest. So it's almost like there's anger in it. It's just a, it's a, there's, often a feeling energetically with sadness, right? That's really low energy. And this is like high energy sadness. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Brendan's saying he's like really reflecting on the sadness that can feel more like defeat, but he's been calling that anguish. Whereas, you know, the definition of anguish that I'm working from here is the one of, so you're to me describing more despair. Helpless, hopeless. <laughs> profound despair yeah and the, and the funny thing is the reason names matter it, it, it's the same feeling for you but it does help us understand our state and experience right when we name something there's a way to identify and work with it and you know you already have the insight that the sadness that you're working with is one of defeat but if we recognize the sadness we're working with is one of like protest, we might need a different set of supportive practices, right? Or shift of our, our mindset. I mean, interestingly, yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Again, and, and the semantics or the words don't matter that much, except to our self understanding. Um, and so it might just be to know like, wow, there could be a form of sadness I was feeling that was one of protest, one where I just couldn't accept it. Usually that is a stage or phase coming after the sudden death of someone we didn't expect. 
So a very classic example is a, you know, a woman who's lost her child. And there might not be that defeated resignation. There's like, no, right? Wailing, yeah, not slumping. Yeah, and I think, you know, knowing again, this, this taxonomy, both of how it can manifest and then also um, how it can be triggered gives us a richness and understanding. There's actually quite a lot of subtle sadness. I've been noticing recently, um, it's pretty easy, maybe easier than I'd like to believe to compartmentalize sadness. Anybody relate to that? Like, no, I'm good. It's gonna wear, okay, back pocket, <laughs> maybe in a drawer. And then it's like kind of there and I don't even notice it, but it's totally influencing how I see the world. And I can actually, you know, in practice, I can get at it as a felt experience. Like there's a, there's a certain, it feels different than when I'm carrying anxiety or frustration. Like there's a different feel. And I think naming and really like rising to the, raising to the surface, what specifically is happening to us, especially with sadness. And it's interesting because we don't, we don't want to, um, I don't like the term wallow because I think we can spend a good long time in our sadness and it's okay. Wallow feels judgmental, like, oh, you should be moving on. As a, a teacher that Christy and I share often says, fuck that shit, <laughs> as a spiritual teaching, because, you know, we, especially, again, talking about grief and, and losing something um, and someone significant to us, there is just no time limit on our cycles of sadness that want to come through and want to um, kind of emerge for us. But there is a way in which we want to understand our sadness, but not to kind of, you know, in some ways make an altar to it. Like, I'm glad that a lot of bands that I love have done that, like literally, like the Smiths, for example, like where would we be without sadness? So much of the music we love would just be gone. Um, and yet, when we get too identified with the sadness, we actually get far away from our equanimity, right? Because with sadness and with loss, we are recognizing that human value that something really mattered to us, that it is so important. And we have to also recognize at that same moment, at that same time, in a certain level, this is how everything is, every single thing. So as Chrissy mentioned, we're not alone because we're all in it. But just trying to ignore that is, is exhausting and feels isolating, like that we're you know, not accepting the reality of it. So it's so interesting because I'm on the one hand suggesting, and I really believe in it, let's get clear and specific on our sadness. Where is it? When is it? How is it? But then like, let it all go. <laughs> And I think of it in some ways as like, well, how are we going to find it if we can't like rise it to the surface, right? And I got to attend last August. I think he's actually teaching it again this September online. Sokni Rinpoche, whose name I bring up all the time, such a beloved teacher. He's teaching a course on the liberation of difficult emotions. I be honest, sorry, Sokni, I don't remember a single specific teaching from the week online course I took last year when he gave it, but just this idea that our emotions can be purified when we can let them rise up and see them. That's not a term we use in psychology much. Uh, and yet there's a, a similar idea of like, well, how are we going to work with what we can't see? Like you can't just kind of pull at the edges of a knot, right? And hope it goes away. We kind of got to pull it out and then see it. So it's so interesting holding equanimity with these strong emotions. And, you know, I really, I love it as a pairing with sadness because of just the profound insight of equanimity to see everything as it is and always changing. It's kind of like a cold comfort. It's not like the rejoicing last week. We're like rejoicing, like, oh, the antidote. In some ways of fear is connection and being together, not being alone. And with sadness, it's actually recognizing that 
we're going to lose everything. That's actually the design. That's like part of what we are um, doing here in this entire healing journey of being alive. So, yes, thoughts, protests. <laughs> Mace has a protest. Okay, yeah. Mm. Such a good question. Yeah. So Mace is asking, how can we do this work of liberating our difficult emotions without bypassing? I do. My simple first answer is going to be embodiment. Um, in that, if we if we are bypassing, there's like a total, in in some ways, effective suppression. Like we haven't integrated the feeling into our body and 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 worked with it and. That sounds funny, but you know, emotions are a physiological experience. They're not thoughts. But when we get really effective at bypassing, it looks a lot like total suppression. And we just don't feel the good. We don't feel the bad. We don't feel anything. I also think sometimes, maybe this is where wallowing comes in. Sometimes we can just move too quick. You know, I know in grieving, the ongoing process of grieving my mom, I've at times felt like, wait, shouldn't I be done yet? Like, am I, am I just wallowing because I'm, you know, finding myself, you know, pulled away by tears once again. And I noticed then I was like, wait, who is saying that and why? So we really have to have that inquiry into ourselves. No one's going to say like, you're done, you're good, tap out, move on. Right. It's, it's up to us. And I realized there was like an egoic sense of I should be done with this phase now. And it's just been so beautiful, like many of you who shared with me about loss um, and just that to know, like, of course, this is how it's going to be for all of us and somewhat different, but it's ongoing. But there was that idea that I'd say the spark of a bypass, like you should be done. You're, you're, you're giving in. So I think the way that we don't bypass is allowing the embodiment and also giving ourselves kind of permission to feel the emotions. It's interesting. I like to think about that more. Because, yeah, please. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So Mace is saying that when she she was uh, quoting the great Chris McKenna, um, wonderful teacher and friend, saying, "Don't technicify your experience, because also you you lose the richness, right? It's if you're really applying a technique too quick, and that's like that beautiful Hafez poem. Don't surrender your loneliness so quickly. Let it cut you more deeply and season and ferment you like so." few human or divine ingredients can because something missing in my heart tonight makes my eyes so soft my heart so tender my need for god so absolutely clear it's such a beautiful poem right like we can't you know we can't move too quick and um letting it stir us again so much beautiful poetry so much beautiful music in just connecting with our sadness and I, I think there's a lot of problems in our contemporary culture with the inability to face fear, anger, but also sadness. You know, it's funny because it is an emotion, as Mace mentioned earlier, that it seeks affiliation. So if you see my face like this, hopefully if I'm doing it well, you, you're like, oh, yeah. But if you see my face like this or like this, you don't want to come close, right? So there's a, an expression that does invoke connection. It's a signal to bring us um, together. Ben has been very patient with his hand. Yes, and then Jimmy. I love the Zoom hand because I don't have to intrude on anything. It's the best thing ever. <laughs> so, um, yeah, yeah saves a lot of neurosis. So do you view there as being mm, a relationship between like, okay, like equanimity 
and how it operates when sadness is present. Um, an interaction between that and something like changing the way that hedonic adaptation works. If that, Say if more. You're familiar with that term. Yeah, hedonic adaptation for folks who don't know is we just really quickly adapt to what is enjoyable at a sensory level. So, for example, it's true. Finally got a blanket shirt, Mace. So nice. I've been wearing it for three days. Sorry, no one's sitting that close to me. And I love it. But by next week, I'm going to be like, yeah, that shirt's cool. But maybe linen would be nice. It's kind of warm out. Or right? just that we can so quickly adapt to these external sources of well being. And it actually, you know, it's samsara, right? It's our constant desire for the new stimulus that makes us happy. So, so um, that question in reference to equanimity of sadness, I want to know more. Well, I mean, you know, there's, uh, hmm. uh, I don't know, I have this sort of, uh, mm, from when I was a kid kind of idea inculcated uh, that like without having sadness there wouldn't be like a contrast against which there can be happiness or something like that yeah 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 absolutely we would never getting rid of sadness would be dangerous and um pathological yeah i think that the suppression of sadness and the inability to share can pervert our sadness. So, mm. you know, I, I have a friend recently who's, who's going through some loss and um, in conversation with them, they were just like very frustrated and kind of talking about how bad the world was, not related to their personal loss. Mm. And just like, I can't believe this thing. And then the Chesa Boudin thing, and know, just really getting themselves worked up and, and frustrated. And then finally, luckily, this person had the insight to say, I just feel overwhelmed by, you know, this loss that they were experiencing. Mm -hmm. So it's like if we aren't attending to in a skillful way, our um, our feelings of sadness, they could turn into anger and blame. They often do. Right. Because that feels better than just being like wallowing or lost. So, yeah. 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 So Christy was mentioning for folks who didn't hear if anyone saw Inside Out the movie sadness and they wanted to like exile her in a way but that was she saved the day. Yeah. And gave a thumbs up. I love that. Jimmy. Hmm. Yeah. 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 Hmm. Yeah. Stuff that I had and lost and had and lost and I lost. It's constant, right? 
Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, Jimmy. Yeah. I'm going to do such a poor job of relaying that to everybody here, but I'm going to try. So Jimmy was beautifully describing, um, you know, just noticing this pattern of feeling frustrated or blame or betrayal instead of loss, like anticipating loss happening, being like not going there let me go to these you know other areas and then when he does finally kind of surrender to the sadness just like i don't want to go there it's a dark deep you know ominous ocean which it's funny given that you love dark deep ominous oceans but not that one uh, but when he surrenders into it it's just sadness and then he can like seek the poetry and songs that really call to him then and it gives him a sense of the true depth of his humanness and i think it's so true it's such a it's such a like literally deep emotion it does feel like it gets to the depths just such an interesting experience right anger is like for me at least like a fireball on my head <laughs> right whereas sadness there's this deepening um i remember a, a heartbreak i had years ago and just felt like my my whole my whole being was like the ground like i was earth on the ground made of ground you know like there was i wasn't even an inch off the ground like i was ground and it was super humbling but it was also like okay well this is safe <laughs> like, there's nowhere else to go so yeah really it is it's a very rich experience and i think you know, watching movies or reading books or listening to songs that kind of help us connect to our sadness. It's good calisthenics for the heart. It is, you know, to kind of open ourselves to it. And for those of you in current grief realms or grief realms that are still circulating, as you know, like just a, a single image or memory or thought will arise and it's like you're on the train. Right, you are in a full blown experience of like the depth of your humanness, and that's rich. A lot of it again is what's our expectation? You know, that it shouldn't be this way, that we shouldn't feel this way. It's like that acceptance, that beautiful acceptance. You know, with equanimity, too, I remember having this really lovely experience. But you know, one of those times when the concept clicks into your lived life. And I used to do this crazy thing um, when I went away to retreats. The first thing I do when I came back is have dinner with my parents. <laughs> no, it was like my ultimate test, right? Like, ha what have I achieved? And um, I actually remember like going down and uh, getting ready to go have dinner with my parents after a longer retreat. 
and I, I wasn't forcing it, but I was imagining them. Like I was trying to imagine them before I saw them. And I realized that like what I was seeing now, or even in the span of my lifetime, is just this sliver of everything they've ever been, everything they might be in the future. And then like all the other aspects of who they are that's just unseen, period. And it was a sense of total acceptance that I don't know and that there's so much more. And I was like, and then I went to dinner and everything fell apart. <laughs> just kidding. It was fine. But like that moment was really like, beautiful and that's not denying like the dysfunctions or imperfections or difficulties of people but it is knowing that there's more because so i think where we get stuck is like not only am i sad i'm always going to be sad everything's sad that's how our emotions work right they filter and control our perception just like when we you know, we hear that car thing beep and we know what the car thing is like. There's just this way that we have a whole program running. So how can we get really more curious? Is there another chat there? I think I see like, uh, I don't know, Noam, if there's anything there. Um, we were having a little chat discussion about the, the, uh, the, the, uh, technicalities of the space and the not having not being able to hear people in the space it's yeah. it's an ongoing thing i know it's okay it's tricky because i've been part of the discussion but okay. sometimes when sometimes it's great when you repeat questions and comments and it would be lovely to hear people speaking but that requires them taking a mic which people don't always want to do blah 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 anyway which is <laughs> that's what the chat was about okay N not grief content not sad. grief content although oh, i think we were, we were sad to not hear what jimmy was saying yeah. <laughs> yes yes <laughs> any other comments questions on this topic protests uh oh are you are you gonna break are you gonna break the cycle Grief is, or sadness is the shittiest of all the emotions because there's like whatever is causing you to have grief, yeah. it's done. There's no undoing it. I mean, maybe you can get back together with him or her, but yeah. like, no, you can't. It's yeah. just over. Like, I don't know. There's just like a finality to yeah. sadness that is different than any of the other emotions and you you're haven't just, been angry for like years yeah but you go someone? and go kick ass or you go scream at somebody or you're motivated and there's like mm. a possibility for change in a way that at least for me sadness is the shittiest yeah and you're also like alone in your emotion in a way that other emotions you're not as alone at least that's my sense is yeah even if i'm sad with somebody about the same thing yeah Mine's like worse and crappier, and I don't right. like want to like get into their brand of sadness. So I don't know. I feel yeah. like it's isolating, and it's it's the past. It's, it's yeah. Over. Yeah. Um, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I um, I disagree okay. respectfully. Uh, a, you're not alone. B, you're not alone. C, you're not alone. Um, just in that, everybody has an experience of, of their emotion that can be super shitty. I mean, I know people who have struggled with anxiety and it is profoundly shitty, you know, where it just is like, doesn't, even though the thing might change that habit of just feeling like the world is unsafe, you literally can't sleep. Right. So there is any emotion can have that what we call like ruminative or preservative, like preservative, whoa, pres pres perseverative, thank you, aspect. Meaning the emotion itself isn't actually ongoing. It's us re-triggering it with our thoughts. I know that might just sound like a nuance, but it's important. Emotions last 30 to 90 seconds, right? And even if we, we lose someone or something really important and they're gone, it's only in our like retrieval of those thoughts about it 
that it continues on. Now there is a difference between like grief and depression and sadness, like those are different um, features, all of which can have sadness. But I don't know, also I've also known people who are embroiled in their hatred, right? Where they are pissed all the time. And it is usually like reasonable, like you could be pissed about injustice morning, noon and night, and it gives you no peace and you feel alone. Why isn't anyone, is no one else paying attention? Why isn't everyone angry like me, right? And um, so there's a way that I think the important piece, and especially for us as practitioners, is to see how we identify with the emotion and how it kind of like contributes to a sense of self and separation. So the work really is like, how does this make me like everyone and not how does this make me unlike everyone? You know, and it's tough because when we really have a, we can't battle with our emotions and win. You know, like there isn't a way to, to, to exile them. And I said this last week, and it's just such, it's so annoying. We actually have to make friends with them. And we don't have to like them all. We don't like our friends all the time sometimes, right? But there's a way of a, it's a total like subtle body, but also physical body. Like it is that um, invitation of like, okay, you too. And we think of that, like that um, feeding your demons classic story, like, putting your head in the demon's mouth of sadness in order for it to evaporate. It's the resistance of like, I don't like it. I don't want that. I just, mm. and that surrender like that, that Jimmy spoke of, which we can have for or not all the time, but to even give ourselves a sense of it. And the loss part is, yeah, we don't get to go back. And that is like, then we get into the territory of regret, which is, in my opinion, feels really not that useful, but I know it has a function. It does help us, you know, choose wisely in the future, hopefully. But that sense of like, it should have, or it could have, that is torture. You know, I think with sadness that can happen quite a lot. Like if I just could have done this or done that, maybe it could have been different. So there's a lot of humility actually in surrendering to our emotions and then the befriending of our emotions too. Um, but yeah, I just really appreciate your honesty and um, yeah, would love to, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I feel like there's a, a beautiful opportunity for a a new loving relationship. Yeah, but I agree with what you said. You try to say this emotion, I don't want it. Yeah. And you're not allowed to live it. You're burn your out. Yeah. <laughs> so Brendan's describing that with with anger and fear, like no problem. He can he can be with them, watch them, see them dissipate, but with sadness. Maybe there's not the same understanding quite yet. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chrissy. Yeah. 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 So the question is, you know, 
when we think of our emotions that we can kind of um, extend or, or discharge or in some ways express in the world. You know, it's interesting, there's actually not great evidence that that's good for us. So in the 70s, there was, you know, the hit other people with foam bats and the data was not great. Like there was a, it was less than 10% of people for whom it was a benefit. Everybody else, it made them matter. Um, so expressing doesn't necessarily mean controlling. And, you know, in fact, when we think about that, like you're strengthening a certain kind of like way of responding, except I will say crying, awesome. <laughs> and I think it's hard, you know, I have had many friends who just are like, I'm so, you know, jealous that you can cry. And I'm like, oh, really? And they're like, yeah, I can't. Like, I don't, I don't know how. And it, it doesn't come easy. So that's not something that's readily available for everyone. And so then, yeah, you got to start writing poetry. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just like whatever can like tenderize the heart, really get that like sense. And that might be, again, that could be just like watching children playing and, you know, there could be a tenderness and there's a way of getting to that feeling of sadness. That's, I, I feel like a, both the joy and the sadness at sunset, right? That just amazing. And then also, ah, oh, it's gone and day is done and transition so yeah there a hand no oh gosh we're, we've gone over so we'll wrap up here sorry oops um there's a, a comment from marianne yeah. that i wanted to read that she says yeah. uh, my, my mom left her body only about a week ago and i'm mm. happy that she is free from her painful prison but in my heart i'm devastated and scattered yeah Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. Yeah. In, in those, and especially in the recency of loss, it's like, there's no choice, right? We really get that upfront experience. With that tenderness, I'm gonna invite us actually to just take a couple moments and come back into this incredibly precious, worthy vessel of our body, heart and mind. And take a moment just to notice what might have shifted in the body since the meditation. Maybe exploring or noticing the imprint and feelingfulness that speaking about and hearing about sadness might evoke. And as though we were wrapping a warm blanket around our experience, Feel a welcoming to whatever is here. Just a softening around the sensations, maybe memories or feelings. Recognizing in this moment, we're all connected by this shared and universal experience. Love and loss and love and loss and love and loss and love again. taking a moment to dedicate our practice the thoughts and feelings and the presence that we've generated here tonight may our practice be of service like that warm blanket like a shelter like a support so that all beings could know comfort in their loss all beings could experience safety and belonging all beings could be free
Thank you, beautiful, beautiful beings. Really lovely to be here. Venerable Tenzin Choki is going to be with us next week. So she'll be doing anger and compassion. Mm -hmm. If you didn't get your fill on sadness, come on back. Great to see you all. Yeah, thank you.